charge to all of us to be more selfish right now in our lives. And who I'm speaking to specifically are younger generations, this Gen Y, this millennial group of people, and people in the crowd that are a little younger than that, which we welcome them to come. And why I'm speaking about this is this stage in our lives is the most important thing that will affect us in the future. How this works out is that we're responding to incentives. In college, it's, I'm trying to figure things out. And that's okay. It's not seen as selfish. It's taking me time to figure out what you need to do. When we're little kids, we're actually encouraged to do this. Find out what sport you want to do. Go to junior high, try the musical, try the band. Figure out what works best. Bill Watterson actually did a great job with this with Calvin and Hobbes in describing this kid had no incentive to help his father and making a joke by it. In doing so, really, he's not expected to do any more than that. But if, say, if someone's 75 and did that, it would be a little odd to us in our culture. Right now, as we're doing this, there's another great example of this in gaming, the, the modern geek culture of, I like comic books and I, I want to love them as much as I can, and when the movie's different, I'm angry about it because they have an attachment to it. There's a strategic card game, of course, that I write for, and in doing so, it describes itself through five different ways, five different colors. One is black, which is the, the swamp skull-looking thing above. And in doing so, how you win beating the other person in this card game is you use aspects of selfishness, amorality, and a parasite nature. Kind of a deep thing for a card game for teenagers, basically. But in doing so, it really describes how the end will justify the means. In order to get a demon or some sort of vampire out, I need to make a sacrifice. I need to kill all my things to hit the ultimate goal. And in doing so, you even see this from an art perspective, too. Vampires are black and evil. But they're not really evil. They're just selfish, incredibly selfish. You would know Darth Vader or Jafar from Aladdin. Are they really that evil? Or is just their conception of what is best incredibly self-serving? So in doing so, they respond to an incentive. This incentive that what I think is best is best, and anything in my way, I will sacrifice and get out of the way. Because I actually think it's for the better good of not only me, but others as well. This idea that you need to build up through something, through an immediate stimulus, and it helps yourself, is actually part of behavioral economics. I wrote my master's thesis about this, and how there are stages you need to get through. As young people, we have to go through this stage. Absolutely, from Calvin and Hobbes, to games, to figuring out your major in college, even when you're a senior and you've changed it three times. That's okay and good. We, there is a large scale and different stages that we go through in life. From the unengaged non-user, and these are the people that are utterly uninterested, didn't get the phone call from Calvin and Hobbes comic, and don't really have an engagement. From there, you hit this selfishness stage. This is the egoism, self-fulfilling thing. This stage is where you buy a baseball ticket for $20. But if you don't get $20 worth of value in it, you're probably not going to buy that baseball ticket again. If it's an 0-1 pitcher's duel and it's raining and your favorite hitter just keeps striking out, you're not going to do it. And the beach, better competition of your time because that's always good. From there, there's a next stage, this impure altruism. This is the stage where you're gaining some utility out of the thing you do, but at the same time, you're giving things up as well. The best example would be for NPR, $5 a month donation. You get a mug. That mug is not worth $60. That mug is only worth $4, 3 $2, but the excess actually still comes back to you. It's just not tangible, and that's a warm glow effect. There's been studies on this in fundraising and altruism research that after you make a gift, a, a, a somewhat selfish, selfless act, you get an increase of happiness for about a week. And for 21 days, you exhibit a warm glow in doing so. This is why you get asked to donate quite often. From there, this is also where most parents are. They get someone in their life that they feel a selfless need to help. The next stage, conditional altruism, is for a short amount of time 
It's always short. You never stay in that stage in your life that you will do anything to help someone else. A mother lifting a car for a baby would be the best example of it, in which everything you do is helping someone else, and you're not even thinking of the thing to be done. Oh, I'm going to give a donation to my friend because, yeah, what they do is good. You don't get anything from it, but you do get that warm glow feeling. And finally, it's a pure altruism thing, which doesn't technically exist because you get it when you're dead. This is the leaving a legacy of sorts, this philanthropic goal of they did something fantastic in life. They received nothing from it, but what they did was purely good in intention. As young people, we're stuck in this stage, myself included, in this egoism stage, and we're unable to move past it. There's two reasons why. One is student debt is the big one, and we're not having kids early enough because of student debt and the recession. So by us not being able to do that, we are still having this selfie culture that Newsweek loves to yell at us about. And in doing so, we can't move past that stage just simply by age. It would be great if we could, but we have to be more cognizant of what we need to do to get there. So this, this conditional altruism, we need to skip a level to have this, oh yeah, I had a great thing happen for a short amount of time. But that's not how it works. It works in stages from the left to the right, not from the right to the left. You have to engage yourself first. You have to see your break room with the last donut and eat the whole thing, not a half. You need to take time out of your day to say, what's really going to motivate me today to do this? I'm going to not respond to the Facebook invite as a maybe. I'm going to say no, I'm not going, because it doesn't influence me at all. And why this is so important is that if we do not get through these stages as a younger generation, we will wreak absolute havoc on our personal lives later. As an 18-year-old, if you're so conscious about other things, you will have a quarter-life crisis, and then a midlife crisis, and divorces become more common. Because you didn't take care of things yourself. Because you can't take care of someone else until you, until you take care of yourself first. So I encourage you to eat that cheese, take time out of your day, and go to happy hour more than you should. There's a secondary reason as well, in that we're not going to have a choice soon. In about 10 to 15 years, 20 in some cases, this baby boomer generation of 65 to 75 million people are going to be at the age where we, as younger people, need to become their caregivers. And there is no equal value that we will receive out of caregiving. The only thing you receive out of it is this warm glow feeling. So I challenge you to prepare for that by skipping your next class, doing the things you want to do right now, and if you're already, you think you're past that stage, indulge yourself a little bit. You don't regress backward to the left, only to the right. Your parents definitely depend on you. Thank you.